Well, welcome to our webinar this evening on Veriflex activation therapy, a novel approach to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients. I am Guru Sher Panjrat, uh, advanced heart failure transplant cardiologist from George Washington University in Washington, DC. I'm professor of medicine and director of the Heart Failure MCS program. We have a fantastic faculty joining us tonight. I have Dr. John Jeffries, who is a J. Michael Sullivan, distinguished chair in cardiology. He's a professor and chief of adult cardiovascular medicine and a professor of pediatrics as well at the University of Tennessee Methodist Hospital System in Memphis, Tennessee. We also are joined by Dr. Christina Economides from the PIH Good Sam System in Los Angeles. She's an interventional cardiologist and is very well experienced in Bariflex activation therapy and will be sharing her experience with us as well. Couple of housekeeping notes. Tonight's webinar will be recorded. Webinar will include three presentations followed by a question and answer session. So we encourage uh, participants to enter their questions into the chat box so that we can address uh, those um, in the question and answer session. With this, I'm going to go ahead with our first presentation, which is uh, by myself on Bariflex as a therapeutic target in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We all are well aware of all the recent developments in pharmacotherapy for heart failure management and the associated improvements and outcomes related to these therapies. Current options in heart failure management include four pillars, which are ARNIs, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors, which, found the, which form the foundation of heart failure therapy. There are obviously many more agents as well, which can be useful. But despite all these advances and improvement in outcomes in clinical trials, in real life day, uh, experience, we know that based on estimates up to 30 to 40% of patients are not on optimal GDMT or guideline directed medical therapy. This could be due to a multitude of causes. Some patients uh, may be non adherent due to inability to afford medications, cost, or due to intolerance as well as lack of efficacy in, in some. If we look at some of the recent clinical trials, we know there is a significant residual risk which remains despite contemporary medical therapy. In fact, when we look at the emperor reduced uh, trial, which was recently published, even in the drug arm, patients on contemporary therapies, 19.4 of those had a primary outcome of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This residual risk, which is in the shaded area, is even higher in those in the placebo or the control group, which mimics some of the real life populations and, pro and poses as an unmet need, which can be uh, addressed with newer advances in therapies. For those patients who may or may not respond to pharmacological uh, agents and may have other specific indications. There are options besides pharmacotherapy, including device options. Specifically for patients with severe mitral regurgitation, a select few of them may be candidates for transcatheter edge to edge repair. Those with atrial fibrillation, some of them may benefit from catheter ablation. And those with a left bundle branch block, an indication for CRT may benefit from CRT therapy. However, despite all these options available, there's a significant number of them who may not be candidates for these therapies or CRT. And that again poses as an unmet need for new developments for management of their symptoms. In fact, based on estimates, CRT is actually only indicated in 30% of heart failure with reduced ejection of fraction patients, with 70% of these HFREF patients do not have an indication for CRT. Many therapies have been explored over the past decades, including vagals and uh, spinal cord stimulation. However, these therapies did not meet clinical endpoints in the uh, previous clinical studies. Despite this, autonomic modulation was continued to be explored as a therapeutic option, resulting in advent of bariflex activation therapy. <clears throat> 
Let's review the role of autonomic nervous system in cardiovascular hemostasis. These are well-known and well-established functions of the beta reflex. Arterial beta receptors stretch less as the systolic and pulse pressure diminish. Activation of the cardiac sympathetic reflex causes a reduction in the arterial beta reflex heart failure modulation. In response to drop in cardiac output and blood pressure, arterial beta receptors unload with immediate activation of the sympathetic and renal angiotensin pathways and resulting in decreased vagal tone, reflexively to compensate. In this slide, you can see in blue lines, which highlights the main pathway, which is the mediated by bare receptors. Heart failure is a state of autonomic distress, and there's a generalized increase in sympathetic nerve traffic, blunted vagal and parasympathetic heart rate modulation, and impairment of the reflex sympathetic regulation of vascular resistance. The primary mechanism for autonomic modulation is via the bare reflexes, and the autonomic nervous system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system are chief creators of hemostasis in the body. When there is a decreased bare receptor signaling, sympathetic outflow goes up. There's a reduction in parasympathetic outflow and a resultant increase in heart failure symptoms. Let's review some of the previous preclinical evidence of uh, role of bare reflex downregulation in heart failure patients. In this particular study, heart failure patients have, were shown to have a less of a change in systolic breath pressure in response to changes in pressure on crowded bare receptors compared to normal patients. In this graph, you can see an association in worsening heart failure symptoms as depicted by New York Heart Association class and bare reflex downregulation or which were assessed uh, by bare reflex sensitivity. As you can see, patients with class three, class four symptoms had a greater degree of bare reflex downregulation compared to those with class one and class two uh, symptoms. With decrease in bare reflex sensitivity or bare reflex downregulation and loss of control over the heart rate or reduced modulation, there's an association with voting survival. And as seen in this particular graph, as there is, a, there is a strong correlation between patients with reduced bare reflex sensitivity and worse survival. So now we know that bare reflex regulation is downregulated in heart failure. And this, this downregulation has significant physiological effects, such as increase in pathetic tone, increase in norepinephrine, filling pressures, and reduction in kidney function. And this results in significant clinical outcomes or consequences, such as increase in biomarkers, yeah. such as anti-pro-BNP, worsening quality of life, increasing heart failure symptoms, reduction in exercise capacity, as well as increased mortality and morbidity associated with that. So with this, I would summarize by saying, despite advances in GDMT for heart failure patients, there's still an important complementary role for devices to improve outcomes in this population. Almost 70% of NYHA class three heart failure patients with an ejection fraction of less than 35% are not indicated for CRT. The bare reflex plays a central role, in fact, a pivotal role in regulation of the autonomic nervous system and cardiovascular hemostasis. When the bare reflex is downregulated, the autonomic nervous system becomes unbalanced. There's elevation in sympathetic tone, there's decreased parasympathetic tone, and all this is associated with worsening heart failure symptoms. And finally, and most importantly, the bare reflex is an attractive therapeutic target for heart failure patients. With this, I will stop and go on to our next speaker, which is Dr. John Jeffries. We can, uh, if anybody has questions, they can are welcome to put into the chat box and we'll address them. Uh, after each talk, or we can, uh, if people want to wait until the end, we will address them in the question answer session. So I would welcome Dr. John Jeffries uh, for his talk on bear stem clinical evidence. Thank you, Grusha, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone this evening.
Uh, next slide. So based on everything that you've heard, the very compelling evidence, then that it uh, begs the question, as Dr. Pajrath has just discussed, the role of the baroreflex and heart failure patients, the question is, could electrical stimulation of carotid baroreceptors upregulate the baroreflex, rebalance the autonomic nervous system, and improve heart failure symptoms? Next. So this is an important study. Um, this was a proof of concept evaluation. Small study, but obviously very telling. So this was a study of 11 patients, single center. All the patients were on GDMT, New York Heart Association Class 3, an LV ejection fraction less than 40%. And baristem therapy was delivered for six months. And you can appreciate here that you can actually see that this chronic stimulation of carotid baroreceptors and heart failure patients on GDMT did improve baroreflex sensitivity. Or another way of thinking about it is it upregulated the baroreflex. Next. So back to the slide that you saw from Dr. Pantrath, you can appreciate, you know, these are the targets that we're trying to pursue. We understand the backdrop in heart failure. So what is baristem doing for us? And we've just demonstrated uh, in the prior slide that there's an improvement in the baroreflex, uh, baroreflex regulation. So now let's look at the effects on sympathetic tone. Next. So in the same study, so N of 11, um, uh, they were able to document that chronic stimulation of the carotid bear receptors in heart failure patients with background GDMT also reduced sympathetic tone steadily over the course of six months. And you can appreciate here on the slide, pretty much everyone had a continuously downward slope in that tone, a couple of patients with some upticks, but overall a very telling slide. And you can appreciate that the, the overall uh, sense of this is that there absolutely is a down regulation over time. Next. So now we've seen that stimulation of these carotid baroreceptors also decreases sympathetic tone in heart failure patients on GDMT. So you can see we're starting to tick these boxes under our baristem column. Next. We also know that there's additional preclinical and early clinical work that's demonstrated additional physiologic effects. We're not going to necessarily dive into that today in any great detail. But these preclinical data and early clinical work have been the foundation for a randomized clinical trial, which was BDHF. Next. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this study, and this was a prospective multi-center randomized trial. And the study was deliberately and intentionally designed to have two phases. So six months sympathetic or symptomatic outcomes uh, evaluation and then a post-market phase for morbidity and mortality. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion, either to receive barrel reflex uh, activation therapy plus optimal medical management or optimal medical management alone. And patients were followed for six months for the three primary efficacy endpoints of a six-minute walk, uh, a quality of life assessment, and nt pro uh, and then obviously underlying safety data, which is always important. Um, the BHF study does have cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalization endpoints built into the study. So that's an important component. And those patients continue to be followed longitudinally. Uh, the morbidity and mortality data will be completed in late 2022 and presented and published in 2023. But the results of the primary efficacy endpoints around symptomatic improvement ultimately led to FDA approval in August of 2019. It was important enough uh, for the FDA to make this device available based on symptom relief to approve the device even before the morbidity and mortality data have been presented. Next. And here are some of the key um, inclusion exclusion criteria for BDHF. And obviously we would encourage you to read the paper when you have more time to digest it. Um, but we think it's an important study uh, Obviously, um, as you can appreciate, class three LVF less than or equal to 35%, a six minute walk, 150 to 400 meters, elevated NT pro BNP or previous uh, heart failure hospitalization, stable uh, optimal medical therapy for greater than or equal to a month. CRT eligible subjects were excluded intentionally, as you saw in some of the prior slides. And there was no restriction, restriction importantly, on AF 
or QRS with or concomitant device therapy, which is important, obviously, in our clinics. Next. Um, importantly, um, you can appreciate um, that uh, if you look at um, this slide and a little bit of, of background information, so that darker color, dark blue, is the device group, okay? And then the light blue would be the control group, so that background therapy. And purple is the difference between those groups. And patients randomized to barostem in addition to GDMT increased their six minute walk distance by 49 meters from baseline. There was a 60 meter difference in improvement compared to patients on optimal drug therapy alone. And you can appreciate uh, at the bottom of this slide uh, that uh, this is about twice the improvement that's seen in some of the landmark CRT studies in the early 2000s. And that's on top of improvements in GDMT in the last 20 years. Um, in multiple drug trials, uh, 25, minim, uh, 25 meter improvement has been considered, as you all know, clinically meaningful. And so the results in BDHF were more than double that. So very important findings, uh, to say the least. Um, and uh, we also know that um, uh, Barostem, when we look at quality of life, for example, um, these patients undergoing Barostem therapy increased their scores by 21 points from baseline, which is a 14 point difference in improvement compared to patients on optimal drug therapy alone. And just to kind of put some contextual understanding to that, this is nearly three times the five-point improvement that has been shown to be clinically meaningful to heart failure patients. And then you can appreciate here when we look at New York Heart Association, once again, obviously, um, we see some dramatic uh, improvement here. So uh, Barostem and GDMT have improved New York Heart Association class by six months, 52% improved by one class and 13% improved to New York Heart Association classes. It's a 34% difference compared to patients on optimal drug therapy alone. So once again, to contextualize this, CRT trials noted about 20, 30% of patients improved New York Heart Association scores at six months. Next. And then our nt pro -BMP data was confirmatory and obviously built in to give us some more uh, information to uh, confirm the effect of the therapy, in addition, obviously, to symptomatic improvement. And BDHF study patients receiving Barostem had a 21% relative reduction in their NT pro BNP levels at six months compared to baseline. That was a 25% relative reduction compared to patients receiving GDMT alone. And just to provide a little bit of backdrop and paradigm, authors noted that heart failure hospitalizations and mortality were reduced when nt pro -BMPs fell by as little as 10%, uh, regardless of the treatment group. So data on hospitalization, mortality, and BDHF obviously is coming, uh, and we await the results. Uh, next slide. And then um, uh, when we see here, even with ARNI therapy, you can appreciate um, both arms of BDHF required to be on max dose uh, GDMT, Baseline treatment with Entresto was similar in both groups, so remember the timing of this study. But patients randomized to the control arm had Entresto added four times more frequently than patients treated with Barostem and GDMT. So obviously we would expect more response in that group that's being having a higher exposure to Entresto. Despite these changes, the Barostem patients had a 25% relative reduction in their nt pro -BNPs. compared to control and they improved their six minute walk, their, mental, uh, their uh, heart failure scores, uh, their Minnesota living with heart failure scores compared to controls. Next. And then obviously safety is uh, paramount to all of us as providers and has to be a given uh, if we're gonna offer these therapies to our patients. And this is important that freedom from major neurological and cardiovascular event uh, free was 97% demonstrating the underlying safety of this therapy. The safety profile is very similar to what you would see in a single uh, chamber ICD or pacemaker study, which I think is very reassuring since we're very familiar with those things in practice. Next. Cardiovascular serious events. So back to our BHF results. 
Um, these are some interesting observations. Uh, remembering these aren't powered endpoints, right? But patients receiving Barostem on top of their GDMT were found to have a, a reduced rate of cardiovascular serious adverse events, so non-heart failure related events or non-cardiovascular death by 51% compared to patients on GDMT alone, which is pretty remarkable. Of special interest was a reduction in cardiac arrhythmias, uh, which I think all of us are interested in uh, exploring those data more. And this is an area that I think we will uh, look at in future studies. Next. Uh, interestingly, you know, when we're talking about modulation, question has to be raised about impacts on blood pressure, right? And, and, and blood pressure and, and vascular tone. And so this is a common question is, will this make my heart failure patient more hypotensive? Um, remember that the baroreflex regulates blood pressure and in BDHF baroreflex activation therapy with the baristem device was shown to actually have a stabilizing effect and sometimes even a slight increase in, in the patient's blood pressure over time, as you can appreciate here on this slide, pretty remarkable uh, data. And at the time of implant, a small acute drop may be noted in blood pressure, but this typically returns to some sort of a baseline in two to three minutes. And after that, there really hasn't been any documented uh, chronic lowering of blood pressure. And obviously that's important for us uh, when we're talking about GDMT in the backdrop of these therapies. Next. So coming back to this overarching slide, we're really filling in our columns. And uh, Dr. Pandrat did a great job uh, under the heart failure. And now we're looking at Barostem specifically. And we have arrows going in a favorable direction, right? So if we summarize all this, stimulation of the bare reflex has been shown to increase barrel reflex regulation. It does decrease sympathetic tone. Uh, it improves a number of physiologic effects um, that have been documented in either preclinical settings or in, in small preclinical work or in early clinical work. But more importantly, probably, is that our randomized data in, in BHF barostem therapy was shown to reduce NT pro BMP, improve quality of life, decrease heart failure symptoms, and improve exercise capacity in heart failure patients compared to those patients that were just receiving GDMT alone. Next. So as we started this uh, portion of the discussion, the question was asked, right? Could electrical stimulation of carotid baroreceptors upregulate the baroreflex, perhaps rebalance the nervous system and improve heart failure symptoms and I think our data demonstrate that stimulation of the bare reflex is an attractive target to reduce heart failure symptoms, as you can appreciate on this slide. We are seeing uh, regulation. We're seeing uh, changes, favorable changes in sympathetic outflow, favorable changes in parasympathetic outflow, and favorable changes in heart failure symptoms. Next. So to build on uh, Grusher's initial summary is we do know all of this background data. We know how difficult heart failure is to treat. We know we have patients with GDMT that still aren't really getting to where we would like to get them ultimately. And so now we know direct electrical stimulation of the carotid baroreceptors upregulates the baroreflex, rebalances the autonomic nervous system, and improves heart failure symptoms. And we've shown all of these different phases, whether it's six minute walk, whether it's quality of life, New York Heart Association, NT Pro BMP, all of these are moving in the desired direction. So thank you, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Tantra. Well, thank you, Dr. Jeffries, for this uh, superb, excellent review of the early studies as well as the clinical trial data on effect of Barostem on uh, Baroreflex activation therapy. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Krishina Economides for her presentation. Uh, which is up next, on sharing some of the real-life clinical experience uh, on, of bioreflex activation therapy in our population. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, I'm going to get right into it. I've been tasked to um, sort of talk to you about the transition from what we just heard from the science aspect to taking care of patients and how it works.
And um, just to get going, I'm an interventional cardiologist. Um, when I explain what I do to patients, I tell them I'm a plumber and I'm gonna open their arteries. So it was interesting to try and figure out how am I gonna explain the autonomic nervous system to lay people. And um, I think going back to things we saw in med school and, and a picture's worth a thousand words. And so it's a lot easier to make it um, understandable for someone uh, to grasp the complexity of what we just heard in the prior two lectures by showing them a picture and knowing that they probably experience, remember experiences in their life when they probably had parasympathetic activation versus sympathetic. So I use this homeostasis and talk about how congestive heart failure in general is uh, an imbalance of the seesaw toward the sympathetic uh, side and that this device is going to do something to change that balance. Um, just um, from another standpoint in terms of what it looks like, um, it's a, there's a carotid sinus lead, a small incision is created to access the carotid bifurcation and secure the two millimeter electrode and lead. Uh, there's an implantable pulse generator that is then tunneled. The lead is tunneled uh, over the collarbone and connected to the IPG in a standard device pocket, very similar to uh, a pacemaker or ICD generator. Um, this is typically implanted in about an hour the procedure takes and many uh, places are doing this procedure as an outpatient in either the OR or in a hybrid OR. And this just takes you through the steps that I just described, um, very similar to um, the uh, slide prior, small incision, electrode sutured, tunnel the lead, um, connect it to the device, place it in the pocket, and then you end up with two incisions. And in terms of what would be required clinically, so in follow-up, um, there should be a post-op follow-up from a surgical standpoint, and then the first follow-up is in approximately two to three weeks post-implant, and essentially the first three to six months are spent bringing the patient back at different intervals, depending on how they're doing, to up, up titrate the device. And after about six months, if things remain pretty stable, um, from a device standpoint, it would potentially be only two times per year. The average battery life is five years without any charging required. And so patients to consider, I mean, this has been reviewed in the first lecture and again with the BDHF trial, but the indications currently are New York Heart Associ Association Functional Class 3 or Class 2 with a recent history of Class 3, an ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%, and TBRO BNP levels less than 1600. Um, and it is not indicated for CRT or for those not receiving adequate response from existing CRT device. So the patients that I consider, so patients who have an ICD and they're still symptomatic despite goal-directed medical therapy, CRT non-responders, hospitalized for CHF or recurrent hospitalizations, um, patients with high-risk indicators such as syncope, ventricular arrhythmias, CVA because of potential LV thrombus because of severely decreased EF, um, but mostly decreased quality of life. And when you see these patients over and over, you, you hear them saying, I can't shower, I can't make my bed, um, I'm tired cooking, stairs are frequently out of the question, I can't walk a few blocks anymore. Um, I get this all the time. I was very short of breath walking into your office today from the parking lot across the street, shopping, spending time with their younger family members, children or grandchildren, and then the things that they used to do seem to be something of the past, golfing, gardening, traveling, et cetera. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get into three case studies um, of uh, my patients and their course. So this was a 74 year old man who uh, had a 20 year course of ischemic cardiomyopathy. So before I met him, he had CAD defined as some sort of MI in 2001, of which he did not know the details. Um, 
later another acute coronary syndrome with an RCA PCI, uh, obviously a diagnosed with an ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 35%. And before I met him, a BIV ICD was placed in 2012. He also had paroxysmal AFib, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. And in 2013, one of my partners met him with New York Heart Association Functional Class 3. And in those years, he had, uh, at that time, he had nine congestive heart failure admissions over 15 months, um, including four thoracentesis. And in 2014, someone said he should have another angiogram. And lo and behold, uh, an LAD CTO was found. A viability study was performed. Um, there was viability. He eventually had a single vessel cabbage, Lima to LAD, and his post-op EF was about 40%, and he improved. He became functional class one to two, and that was in 2014. Fast forward to 2019, when, I, um, when he became my patient, he was functional class three with an EF of 30% and an LV thrombus when he represented. And over the course of 19 months, he had six heart failure admissions, um, eight thoracentesis, and by June of 2020, his EF had dropped to 20%. A few months later, he had a syncope admission. He was hypotensive. He hit his head. Thankfully, his head CT was negative. Again, his EF was still 20%. So going through the usual algorithm, he did have another cath. His Lima to LAD was patent. His RCA stents were patent. He had moderate circumflex and right PDA disease, both of which were evaluated with FFR and found to be negative. Um, and his LV EDP was 12. Um, he was on amiodarone, Coreg, only 3.125 BID, digoxin, Lasix, 40 BID, potassium, synthroids, spironolactone, metolazone, simvastatin, coumadin, and Plavix. And so we talked to him about this procedure, this device, and he agreed to it, and it was implanted in October of 2021. And so in follow-up two weeks post-implant, he came to the office, he reported decreased shortness of breath, he said he felt improved, and he had not used any metolazone since the implant. Two months post-implant, he still was reporting less and less uh, shortness of breath, and now he actually said for the first time, and his family could definitely notice that he had improved energy. He was now using Lasix just once a day instead of BID, and he had had no recurrent CHF admissions. And nine months post-implant, that's where we are now, he has not been readmitted at all. He's using Lasix only PRN, and he's New York Heart Association Functional Class 1 to 2. So this is after 20 years of dealing his, with his ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, you know, all in all 15 heart failure admissions. Moving on to the next um, study or the next case study. This is a 79 year old woman with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So she was initially diagnosed um, in 2014, her EF was 40%. She had a known left bundle branch block. At the time, her NYHA class was two, and she was having frequent PVCs, um, but was on some degree of medical therapy and really didn't have that many complaints. Um, fast forward four years, she presented and reported decreased exercise capacity, saying she used to be able to walk one mile uh, a day and now was walking two blocks um, over the prior year. She was found to have paroxysmal AFib with also a different arrhythmia of ATAC, presyncope, and a CRTP was placed at that time. Um, a year later, her EF was 30% and she was having salvos of non-sustained VT and her CRTP was uh, changed over to include an ICD. In November, a few months later, she had syncope with her ATAC and she had been intolerant to numerous antiarrhythmic medications that had been tried, including propafenone, amiodarone, ticosin, actually caused VT. So she eventually went an a flutter ablation. They did find her ATAC, but they said it was too near the sinus node and it was not ablated. At the time, she had tried Entresto, um, but developed a cough. Uh, she also had on-off kidney failure, 
uh, also developed a cough with hydralazine. Um, the following year, her EF was still 35%, but now she was class three. She was offered an AV node ablation due to ongoing tachyarrhythmias and medication intolerance. Um, she had this done. And in July, she had no improvement um, and actually had several op episodes of uh, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation with her device. She was admitted, she was uh, hypotensive, um, also had hypokalemia at times and hyperkalemia. Uh, she was short of breath and her EF was 20 to 25%. At the time, she was on Coreg, spironolactone, Lasix, and Eliquis. And we recommended a barrel stim to her, uh, but she had been through so much that she, she decided she was going to think about it and put it off. So she finally came last November and had it implanted. One week post, she came to the office and said she felt like she was significantly improved from a shortness of breath standpoint and was only using Lasix PRN. Two months later, she said she felt great and that her last episode of shortness of breath had been just prior to the implant and that she had improved energy. Four months later, she had had no recurrent admissions and she was New York Heart Association class one to two. And four and a half months later, she had a repeat echo and her EF had improved to 40 to 45% and was doing well. Now we're at eight months post and she has not been readmitted and is doing well. And just one last quick case. Um, this is a, another uh, woman, 77 years old, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, horrible EF of 10 to 15%, New York Heart Association functional class three, had had a CRTD placed in 2016, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, CVA, history of breast cancer, right mastectomy, depression, some mild dementia, and actually uh, an LV thrombus. And she had had multiple CHF admissions over five years at different hospitals and had been intolerant to several different medications and max doses, including uh, episodes of hypotension and on and off chronic kidney uh, failure. Uh, her meds now included Corlinor 7.5 BID and Tresto low dose, Lasix 40 BID, Eliquis and Zoloft. And she had a barostim implanted last July, actually a year ago. Two weeks post-implant, she had decreased shortness of breath and significant decrease in her edema. Two months later, her EF was about 20 to 25% and no longer had an LV thrombus. And right now we're at four months later. Sadly, she's had four congestive heart failure admissions, but they are all secondary to patient noncompliance. Um, her dementia has progressed and what has happened is the family reports she starts feeling so well and being very active and she thinks she's cured and she stops taking her medication. Um, so the barrel stim alone isn't enough for her. She's got to stay on her meds, but uh, this has uh, resulted in four C CHF admissions. Um, but once she's on her meds, she, she does quite well. So in summary, um, the barrel stim, as you heard earlier, is FDA approved for improvement of symptoms in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's a novel device option for patients who are not indicated for CRT or who are refractory to goal-directed medical therapy and or CRT. Um, in the BDHF study, the barrel stim significantly improved quality of life, exercise capacity, functional status, and NT pro, pro BNP. So thank you for your attention. And I believe we're gonna be answering questions now. Well, thank you Dr. Economist for that uh, excellent presentation on reviewing the indications as well as uh, some of the real life cases reflecting challenges in management of these rather difficult patients, which we all come across uh, on a daily basis. Uh, with this, uh, you know, the presentation part is over and we're gonna open up for question and answer with the uh, panel. And uh, we encourage uh, everyone to put in their questions into the chat. We have some questions coming in. Let me start off by asking a question for our, our faculty here. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, just basic heart failure management, what is your approach in optimizing guideline-directed medical therapy and assessment of residual symptoms and follow-up plan? Uh, either uh, John, you want to take it? 
Sure. So I think part of the question really revolves around when is the right time to consider ferrostem therapy? And I, I think we heard from, from Christina some excellent considerations there. And, you know, for us, I, I think we've tried to make it a, a conversation with our patients to understand are they really satisfied where they are uh, with their heart failure therapy and living with heart failure and as you heard, a lot of this really is targeting symptoms, quality of life. And a lot of our uh, driving force behind that has been those uh, thoughtful conversations, I think, with patients. And I think to extend upon that, and I'd love to get everyone else's opinion, is just, you know, do you have an opportunity to maybe adjust therapy, titrate uh, up uh, in the face of Barostem? And the answer is yes, we, we have seen that as an opportunity as well. So maybe those patients we aren't achieving our target goals, does the underlying therapy perhaps give us a little more freedom and actually institute the, the doses we should be leveraging in these patients based on clinical trial data to achieve the outcomes that we hope to achieve? I think it is another arm of opportunity to make that happen. Well, that's actually a pretty important point which you make, John, on, you know, a lot of these patients are hypotensive on multiple therapies and are intolerant. And as Christina showed in her patients that uh, they were hypotensive, with, you know, which limited the use of uh, more, uh, you know, proven therapies in terms of uh, pharmacological therapies. And they actually uh, tolerated uh, bear stem pretty well with improvement in symptoms. And this goes back to the data you shared from BHN mm -hmm on the stabilization. And I think that's important because that comes up all the time from, you know, uh, from my own colleagues as well as um, patients, like about what about effect on blood pressure? And as you showed the data that the blood pressure stabilizes, it's, it's not as much as modulating or reducing it, but stabilizing it and allowing some therapies. So with that, you know, I wanna ask uh, Christina about, you know, in her real life extensive experience now with these patients, uh, what, uh, what's your approach on assessing response to CRT therapy in these patients? Like, you know, patients who have heart failure with reduced infection, have a left bundle branch indication for CRT. And, and we know that a lot of them have reversible symptoms. And what, how do you assess these that who are non-responders and uh, uh, your approach on them? So that's a great question because a lot of, at early, in the early 2000s, people were promised a lot with CRT. And, um, you know, people have gotten this. And I remember, you know, you'd make these echo appointments where you'd come and try to optimize the CRT with device changes, et cetera, et cetera. And here we are now in 2022, still trying to find ways to make these people feel better. So, um, I definitely always look to see, are the, is the CRT really being CRT? Are they up there 99%, 100% B-PACE? Because that's always part of it. If they're not being um, by B-PACE a fair amount of the time, I, you know, we need to look at the device and how it's programmed and, and do we need to make changes there? Um, so I definitely still you know, interrogate and, and look and see, is there anything that can be maximized from that standpoint? As with all patients, the comments you both have made uh, with goal-directed medical therapy, I have very few patients who can tolerate max dose and Tresto, you know, and max dose spironolactone and Toprol or Porig or whatever it is. Uh, very few of my CHF patients are actually on the doses that uh, were studied in the clinical trials. They just, they just can't tolerate them, but that's always important. I think Anyone, anyone with a horrible EF should have had an ischemic evaluation for sure. Um, that goes without saying. Um, and then looking, putting it all together, if they're just not doing well, I start talking to them about this device and offering it to them. In fact, I have a patient who has a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, who has CRT and has done well for probably about five years, but he got COVID a few months ago and found himself readmitted for CHF for the first time. He also has um, a chronic renal insufficiency and, you know, he doesn't need necessarily the barrel stim at this moment, but I started talking to him about it already and putting it out there and, um, you know, sent him to uh, have a consult with the surgeon. Uh, so I think being proactive and telling patients uh, 
letting them know all the options and what's out there is important. And in the context of, you know, when you, Christian, you mentioned about uh, guideline-driven medical therapy optimization and, you know, tolerance, uh, in our experience, we, we obviously, you know, have a, a, a pretty large size heart failure clinic. Uh, in our therapies, actually, we, we do have mimic or mirror almost better than clinical trial uh, adoption of GDMT in these patients. Uh, however, as we've seen, despite all that, there is residual symptoms in a significant amount of patients, as well as as we saw the data from some of the recent contemporary trials that up to 20% of the patients, even in the drug arm, had a primary outcome event. So, you know, it's clearly uh, there's great achievements with GDMT. And, you know, I think that should be the goal is to kind of drive it up as much as we can. That's, you know, we ought to do that. But despite that, there's a big unmet need. And I think that's an important message. Uh, with that, let me ask you something. Like now, how do you explain the patient the, 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 the need for these neurotherapies? They're already all of them. You know, there's so many therapies. We keep on pounding them with this medication and that. And then you go in and say, you know, how do you really explain them the need for another device? Yeah, so I think um, one of you touched on it as well, like um, what is their quality of life um, at this time? I think that conversation is more easier received and sort of accepted if a patient keeps getting hospitalized with CHF, sadly. Um, but it's, uh, you know, when they're stable and out here in the clinic, um, it's a little bit harder to sell yet. Wait, you want to give me another device? You want me to do another procedure? Um, but I do try to explain, as I showed in the first slide, you know, what is actually happening to them and how the sympathetic system, nervous system is, is winning uh, the battle right now. And that this is a device that's potentially going to change that for them. So, um, you know, I try to concentrate on this is, this is what's out there. These are the things that we've done for you so far that, that you're eligible for, or, you know, you know, we can't go do this because of X, Y, Z. Uh, and then just talk about the device and put it out there. And, and, you know, obviously they think about it and decide ultimately, but. John, like, yeah. you know, there is a, a question from the audience about, and I think kind of, you know, uh, I would love to get to hear your views and, you know, about what about early adoption? And do we intervene mm -hmm. earlier or do we wait till, mm -hmm. you know, you already run out of options and then symptoms? And especially going back mm -hmm. to the early slides, we looked at physiology and that autonomic imbalance and the role of bare flex downregulation and heart Absolutely. Pain. What are your views on that? Yeah, and I think, and I, and I will answer that. I want to come back and just and, and close the loop on a couple of things that we've just been talking about as well is that how do we discuss it with our patients here? You know, oftentimes we will go in with, cartoons, you know, depictions and diagrams, and we can actually show them what the device, uh, what the implantation looks like. And as Christina alluded to, really is what we're trying to achieve. And that seesaw model is a great one. I think the other thing of importance about GDMT is it's great to prescribe GDMT, but as we all know, and that prescribe these medicines, they're disrupted oftentimes, right? Blood pressure was too low in the ER and the primary care office, wherever. So the medicines were down, titrated, or maybe even held temporarily. So remember these therapies, it's the time that you're actually receiving those longitudinally, right? They need to be receiving those doses as much as possible into the future. And if this therapy provides that backdrop that you can reliably maintain the blood pressure and keep the patients on the doses that you desire, I think that's an important concept that we have to remember. Um, but as far as earlier therapy, I think it's a wonderful question. And I, I think uh, Grusher and I talk about this a lot in the heart failure space is, you know, how can you be more preemptive? It's very hard to treat patients when they're really far down the path, right? And even though you have the medications on board, I have to admit, as I've become more familiar with this therapy and the results that we are seeing in our own personal experience, not based on any reports or uh, anecdotal evidence, but what we see clinically, I am impressed with what the opportunity is. And so we are starting to dialing into our conversations a little bit sooner, meaning 
could we be doing these things in parallel in some way? And the answer is, I think, possibly. Um, you know, you need uh, a good clinic. I think that, you know, you have obviously the resources to offer these therapies. But for us, um, if you think about it, what we're trying to do with drugs in many ways is to, is to change that balance, right, when it comes to sympathetic tone. What if this is an additional layer to do that to help us to get there earlier? And perhaps that does lead to favorable changes at the myocardial level and other things. Those are the things I think that are intriguing about the therapy that we'll know more about as we continue to uh, accrue patients, you know, and study them longitudinally. And, you know, uh, with that in uh, you know, mind about early intervention, there is a question from our audience uh, about experience with patients who are on inotropes. Uh, are those patients, uh, you know, benefited from this therapy? Is it too late? Or uh, do, does the panel have any experience with those kind of patients? And I can I ask people mine after you guys go ahead. I, I do not have experience <laughs> for implant on someone who has been on, is actively on anotropic therapy. Is she not? No, I'm sorry. Uh, I do not either. Um, I, I do not have any experience with anyone on home inotropes um, so far um, or even in the hospital. Yeah, I don't. All right. And, you know, to, to that effect, and, you know, I think if you really kind of mimic going back to what John was talking and, you know, if you even look at the cases Christina presented and, and some of the underlying physiology, uh, I think that's is where, you know, earlier intervention is more important to prevent that kind of spiral down to that stage. And even based on the current indication is class three and class two with recent class three indication. So, you know, unfortunately, when inotropes kick in, that imbalance, I don't know how much of that is uh, salvageable. And, you know, some of the reflex uh, phenomena may be, uh, uh, may not be conducive. So, uh, we, you know, in our own experience, we've had people who ended up uh, spiraled into an, on an anotrope because of some other reasons, not enough time from, and this is an earlier experience with this therapy where they didn't have time for really, you know, uh, upright traditional therapy as Christian has showed in the slide from weeks to months over time. And, but uh, yeah, in generally, uh, I would say that we do not uh, recommend patients on inotropes on, uh, for this therapy at this point. Now, uh, there's a question about, you know, who actually implants them, you know, uh, and I can tell you in our site right now, uh, we have cardiovascular surgeon implanting it, but we know that across the country, there are different models. There's a question from one of the uh, audience whether interventional cardiologists are implanting in Christina. Uh, how about your uh, model? So uh, uh, I am an interventional cardiologist, but I am not implanting it. It's just that I have this, you know, I've been pretty proactive about getting my sick patients uh, to get this therapy. Um, here at our hospital, our, actually our cardiothoracic surgeon is doing it right now. Um, two of them are. So, um, and also I believe mostly across the country, vascular surgeons are doing it. Yeah, it's similar for us. Uh, we have our vascular team in planning currently. You know, other thing, uh, I uh, was really fascinated, uh, Christian, in your patient presentations is like the need for diuretics went down. You yeah, know, that and, and that's, a, that's a phenomenal, you know, experience. And a lot of our patients struggle with, you know, use of diuretics. And we see some benefit now with use of SGLT2 inhibitors, with coming down on diuretics. And then as you show on top of all this, as we go with this uh, bare flex activation, uh, is if that extra benefit. Uh, what, what, what do you think is a plausible mechanism? And, you know, is this going to be on a lot of patients or, you know? I'm hoping this is a common theme, frankly. Um, I mean, if you step back and you look at Entresto, um, I've, I've had a similar response as well. The more you titrate your Entresto up, uh, I've been able to titrate down the Lasix um, in a lot of patients. And I think this is a very similar thing. Um, if you can get them to a place where they're, uh, you know, the system has reset, as you say, um, and there's less activation of the RAS system, I think 
you know, their own diuresis um, works. We also have noticed in some of the patients, I didn't present this, but some of their creatinines have improved, frankly. Um, and you're taxing that system less with, with less diuretics as well. So I hope this is a, an ongoing theme that we see because that's also, you know, that one patient, she had all kinds of electrolyte imbalance and, and it got too much for her to manage on her own. She was having episodes of hypo and hyperkalemia. Um, that's very dangerous. And, and, you know, she almost suffered the consequence for it. So um, I think it's, it's a good thing. I hope it continues. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, obviously, you know, chronic loop diuretics have their own pitfalls, right? Whether that's diminution of renal function, whether, you know, we're potentially making pre-renal AKI scenarios, which could lead to CKD, which is not helpful in the heart failure population. I think all those things are hopefully once we accrue more real world data, we can look at that information. And I think to build on uh, Grusher's point is what are the other favorable impacts that are complex in heart failure management, and we alluded to it a little bit, with rhythm disturbances, right? Um, what about things like if we could reduce AF burden, for example, with this? That's an important opportunity. So I think we probably are just starting to scratch the surface on some of the phenotypic impacts that Barristan may have. That's great. Uh, you know, that, 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 you know, the, the other pleiotropic effects and also, you know, effects on the, this kind of regulation of this imbalance on uh, not only the hemostasis from uh, renal effects, but other uh, endocrine effects is going to be something phenomenal to look at, obviously, as, as the data comes in and, and, you know, hopefully with future studies that can be addressed. So there's a lot of, I think, excitement uh, with this uh, particular uh, modality. Now, Christian, you have such extensive experience, and I'm going to ask you to help us uh, understand what is the follow-up look like for these patients? You know, how does all this fit into a busy practice? People ask, okay, fine, you know, I have another device. I, I'm going to, patient's going to come in. How, what does the flow look like on, you know, weeks, yeah. months? What do you do? How do they take, get taken care of? Yeah. So, um, first of all, we want to make sure that, that you know, we, we have the rep here uh, for that appointment and that we're able to interrogate the device. Um, typically, it's two to three weeks post-implant. And then every six weeks or so, six to eight weeks for the first three to six months, depending on how they respond. I mean, they come into clinic. Um, it's very similar if they come in and they actually have a, a pacemaker or a CRTD. Um, the, the rep will come, will check the device. They will try to titrate up and do orthostatic vital signs um, with, with the device up titrated and also at the same time making sure that the pa patient isn't aware of any stimulation. Um, and... Um, find out how, how far up we can titrate the device. Um, and then I, you know, I see the patient, we go over all the meds, physical exam, uh, all of that. Um, but it's about every, I would say six to eight weeks for the first three months at least, and then um, up out to six months. And so, um, you know, it's, a, it's an appointment that's very similar to if they have a CRTD, it's, but looking at the whole picture, uh, it's not, necessarily the shortest appointment, <laughs> but. Um... So, you know, you mentioned about CRTD and this question comes up from both our patients when we're talking about these therapies as well as our cardiologists, reference cardiologists. What is there, if there's any potential interference between these devices and uh, like the existing devices and, and uh, you know, bears them? And an answer to that, just for the audience is there is no interference, non-interference. And as we know from the BHF, the slides, safety slides as well, but 80% of the patients had an ICD in the trial and there was no interference noted on that trial. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's important to kind of uh, know. Um, I think we are uh, on the top of the hour, we're getting close. Uh, I would like to thank the faculty for this phenomenal presentation and the discussion. Uh, I think this field is getting, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, it's very exciting, uh, this new therapeutic option, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously has shown to improve quality of life, uh, heart failure, reduce heart failure symptoms, uh, and um, 
you know, uh, potentially reduce potentially reduce hospitalizations and with more data to come later this year. And I think uh, this is an, another opportunity for us to uh, further uh, optimize the care for our patients uh, in our practices. So with this, I, I would again thank you all and I would like to thank CBRX for hosting this webinar. And, uh, you know, uh, if you have any questions, uh, put them into the chat box and I'm sure somebody will address them. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.